Hi, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for coming here today to participate in um, our Structural Polyethylene Systems uh, webinar series um, covering the design, specification, and standards uh, related to structural polyethylene applications in the water, wastewater, stormwater space. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started here today. I'd uh, respectfully ask all panelists and organizers across North America to please mute your phones unless you need to speak. Um, sometimes uh, uh, some background noise can be quite distracting for others on the call. Um, anyone who has any questions, uh, please submit your questions via the GoToChat application at the bottom or an email to us and we'll endeavor to compile all those questions and distribute a Q&A response to all attendees who are on the call today. Uh, as this is a live, unrecorded webinar, um, if we sometimes run into uh, connection issues, please remain on the line if we do have a connection issue, uh, and we will reconnect uh, right away and, and begin with the webinar. Um, the webinar will end promptly at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, and uh, regardless of any issues along the way. And a one-hour PDH continuing education credit certificate will be issued to all those that are logged in for the full duration of the webinar. If you have any questions regarding that certificate, you can contact Adam Reputikowski, our um, Saskatoon, Manitoba Regional Field Consultant. Um, offices holding this webinar from a conference room. A number of firms have logged in that are holding the webinar from a conference room setting. Uh, we would ask that you pass around a sign-in uh, sheet for all those in attendance. Uh, scan that and send that to Vidi Parikh at upanor.com uh, to receive PDH credits for all those in attendance in the room. A little bit about uh, the folks here on the call today. Uh, my name is Brian McGuire. I'm Upanor's manager of our engineered systems portfolio. I'm a licensed professional water resource engineer in civil uh, discipline. I uh, hold a BS in civil engineering from the University of Maryland. Uh, my experience background uh, includes some work on both sides of the engineering and, and manufacturing and construction uh, business. I have about 12 years as a project engineer uh, working on water and wastewater projects municipal infrastructure utility projects, uh, and then I also have about 10 years of experience on the manufacturing and construction uh, side of the business. And it gives me a unique perspective uh, to be able to support engineers uh, to evaluate the most appropriate systems for their particular applications. Uh, also with us on the call today is Adam Reputikowski. Adam is our field engineering consultant or sales manager for the Saskatoon and Manitoba region. Uh, Adam works with engineers, owners, contractors to support projects uh, from start to finish. He works with engineers to uh, evaluate feasibility, provide budget proposals, uh, specifications for bid packages uh, and full-scale design and then during the bid process he supports contractors uh, to evaluate installation cost and deliverability uh, and then following um, manufacture of the system he uh, supports them in the field on site uh, to oversee installation uh, and ensure flawless execution of our projects. Uh, so Adam's really involved in, in our projects from start to finish and he's there as a resource for you should you need support anywhere along the way in the project development. Uh, also with us uh, as panelists and organizers, we have Jerry Groen and Dan Polovic. Jerry is our uh, chief engineer. He is responsible for overseeing all open or design work in North America. He is a licensed professional engineer with over 40 years of experience. Uh, he also oversees all R&D and manufacturing quality control efforts uh, within our organization. We're happy to have him here. Uh, Dan Pavlovic uh, is our lead technical service engineer. Dan is responsible for producing all of the drawings and deliverables uh, necessary to support the engineering community with specification, design, and bid of our systems. Uh, and he's a, a mechanical engineer um, with a professional engineering license as well. Uh, and both Jerry and Dan work out of our Mississauga office in Toronto. A little bit about our agenda today. Uh, we endeavor to put together an overview uh, of some of the primary design considerations uh, and details related to structural polyethylene systems that uh, engineers would be concerned with during the development and specification process. Um, we could spend many, many hours on each one of these individual topics, but we thought it best to uh, have the initial webinar be an overview. And then subsequent future webinars will get into more detail on different elements 
of this particular webinar. We'll cover, um, you know, in more depth uh, for a full one-hour series on some of these topics in the future. Uh, but today's agenda will give you an introduction to Upanor. For those that are not familiar with Upanor, uh, cover Wheelite, the material profile, uh, how it's manufactured, and what sort of uh, applications it can be used in in engineered systems. Uh, we'll talk about thermoplastic welding standards, practices, and quality control methods. Uh, because of eng our, our engineered systems do rely on thermoplastic welding, it is important for engineers to have a, a baseline understanding of thermoplastic welding and quality control. We'll discuss horizontal pipe and vessel design per the Plastic Pipe Institute. Uh, we'll briefly cover material testing. Uh, and then cover finite element modeling and when that's applicable, uh, where Plastic Pipe Institute Chapter 6 horizontal vessel design uh, is not necessary or doesn't meet the application. Uh, we'll cover buoyancy countermeasure for vertical and horizontal applications, uh, installation and backfill standards in accordance with ASTM D2321, which is the governing standard, uh, and then we'll briefly cover with whatever time is left uh, some example applications. So, a little bit about Upanor Infra. We were formerly KWH Pipe in North America, founded uh, in 1951. Uh, recently, as, as recent as 2013, we were rebranded Upanor Infra across North America by way of a corporate acquisition merger. Um, we have been manufacturing polyethylene pipe and fabricated systems of different kinds since 1951 uh, and have a number of brands along that line. Sclare Pipe, Wheel Gas, and Wheelite may be some of the brand names you've heard of, uh, with Wheelite being the most appropriate or applicable material to our engineered systems portfolio, as we'll discuss here in a second. Uh, the Wheelite product has been available since the late 1980s, and we are an ISO 9001-2008 certified uh, company, uh, and we are on track to get our 2015 certification, which just came out at the end of 2015, and we have a few years to get up to speed there. Uh, we are certified uh, under NSF testing uh, to ASTM standards for both solid wall and structural profile wall wheelite, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, under NSF testing for full-scale deflection testing, and one or a few manufacturers in the country that actually has that testing certified under NSF. Uh, we have two manufacturing plants in North America, uh, one in Huntsville, Canada, and the other one in Saskatoon, Canada. Uh, and we have uh, probably one of the most important items on this list about our company is that we have extensive engineering and support behind all of our systems. Uh, we have full-scale in-house engineering support to support engineer of record with development of design drawings and details. Uh, we have field support uh, necessary to ensure flawless execution of our projects. So whatever amount of support is necessary for any given project, uh, we have the resources to support your project. A little bit about Wheelite and Wheel Panel. Uh, Wheelite is a, a robust structural box cross section, as you can see there on the photo on the right. Um, it's a heavy duty box, or depending on how you look at it, I beam cross section. You may recall from structures or mechanics of material, uh, the modulus of the box or I beam section is an extremely rigid cross section. And we rely upon that rigid cross section to uh, develop large scale pipe applications. We're able to produce uh, Wheelite pipe in diameters of up to 132 inches. Uh, and depending upon diameter of the profile, uh, we're able to accommodate fill height nearing 50 feet in fill. So an extremely robust material, not to be confused with lighter gauge, uh, less uh, robust materials like uh, corrugated exterior smooth interior HDPE, which is limited to about 5 feet in diameter and, and at that diameter about 6 to 8 feet cover height. So Wheelite is an extremely robust structural cross-section polyethylene material. It is 100% polyethylene material. Uh, and that cross-section gives us some structural advantages, some durability advantages, and advantages in, in a number of applications that we'll discuss as we look at some applications. Uh, here's a CAD snapshot of the wheel light cross-section. As you can see there, this particular cross-section is about a 6.77 inch cross-section across in width and about 5.5 inches in depth. Uh, each one of those box extruded cross-sections are um, uh, inside and outside extrusion weld, as you can see by those dark black triangles there, those are extrusion weld points which attach those. And this box cross-section can be extruded and uh, combined to form a circular pipe whoops, uh, circular pipe by extruding it and winding it in a helical fashion around a mandrel, as you see here, to create diameters of up to 11 foot. Um, or we can extrude it in flat sheet material, as you can see here, which we refer to as wheel panel. Um, 
and create uh, sheets of material that are able to be used as bulkheads, end sections, buoyancy countermeasures for, for vessel applications. We can also combine them in rectangular form uh, to create uh, modular structures, any rectangular structure you can imagine. So in summary, we have a robust structural profile here that has both inside and outside welds. Um, we're able to extrude large diameter pipes that are extremely robust, capable of accommodating extreme fill heights, uh, rectangular materials. Uh, and we combine those using thermoplastic welding and fabrication standards and high quality control uh, plant environment to create a host of engineered systems uh, for the water, wastewater, and stormwater space. Essentially anything you can imagine where the pumping treatment or storage of water is required, uh, we can fabricate a system that's not only cost effective up front on a material and total installation cost basis, but also provides a hundred year design life in the face of hydrogen sulfide, sulfuric acid deterioration common in wastewater applications, extreme pH, either low pH or high pH, uh, corrosion uh, and abrasion. Uh, HDP, most folks don't know, is extremely abrasion resistant. Uh, so we're able to fabricate equivalents to concrete, steel and fiberglass that are not only cost effective, but have a much longer design life. Um, and so we'll show you some of those systems. Um, you know, again, 100-year design life, versatility and durability. Um, we're able to fabricate stormwater detention structures, CSO pump stations, wastewater treatment applications, geothermal vaults, irrigation systems, custom structures, culvert realign, the sky's the limit. Uh, rather than go through the laundry list, it's best to just show you some photos of the types of systems and you'll see more throughout this presentation of different applications. Uh, these next two slides are generally just photo collages of the types of systems that we can fabricate uh, to open uh, engineers' minds on applications that we may be useful to them on their projects. Uh, here you can see a, a header system for a CSO manifold a stormwater detention system up in the top left, uh, even infiltration, uh, perforated infiltration designs, as you can see there on the right, um, utility pull box structures, water quality control structures, outlet controls, culvert relines, uh, and manholes are a common application. We can custom design manhole applications to meet any configuration for a given project uh, and provide so cost effectively, both reducing the material costs and long-term uh, cost of ownership as well. Um, and also piping, uh, horizontal bends, vertical bends, vertical and horizontal bends in combination with riser structures and confluences uh, are, are we can accommodate using structural polyethylene systems in the wheelite material. Uh, some up-close photos here that show you some of the fabrication complexity and, and quality. Here you see about a 20,000 gallon rainwater vessel. Uh, it has base reinforcement and a wheel panel bulkhead, so that's a wheel light uh, pipe or vessel material for the, the barrel and a wheel panel bulkhead with wheel light risers stubs coming off the top. Uh, so that you can see a completely prefabricated watertight system ready to be delivered to the field and set. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about the wheel light panel or wheel panel's ability to create rectangular structures. Uh, wheel panel is about one-tenth the weight of concrete. Uh, and this really opens the door to our ability to prefabricate structures that really would be infeasible in precast. Uh, we can create a structure that's about 11 and a half feet wide by 11 and a half feet high out to out and about 45 feet long entirely out of structural polyethylene. We can include all the penetrations, uh, exterior components, and internal components. So whatever level of fabrication, uh, componentry necessary to support the application, we can custom design a system and have it completely prefabricated at our plant prior to delivery. As you can see in this blow-up isometric, you can see internal baffle walls. Uh, this is obviously a particle separation system uh, with baffle walls to increase flow path for particle separation via Stokes Law um, for TSS removal. Uh, and you can see hopper bottoms on the bottom, internal baffle walls to increase flow path, uh, inlet outlet controls and, and the like necessary for this particular application. Um, you know, without the ability for us to manufacture a structural polyethylene system using wheelite and wheelite modular for this particular application, uh, the engineer would have been limited to concrete or steel uh, to build this. Obviously, if it were concrete, precast would have uh, been unwieldy. Uh, they would not have been able to ship a structure of this magnitude, uh, completely prefabricated and precast. They wouldn't be able to handle it and ship it. Uh, in the field, it would have required many, many months of precast, multiple pours, uh, and then at the end of the day, they would 
would not have had a system that had a 100-year design life. It had more of a 30 to 40-year design life for that particular application. And obviously, steel uh, would not have achieved even a 20-year uh, design life for that particular application. So using Wheelite, we're able to uh, not only provide large-scale rectangular applications for above and below ground structures, but also increase the design life for different applications. Um, this is a snapshot of a manifold header system uh, for a combined sewer overflow project. There's a, a number of combined sewer or CSO projects throughout North America. Most major metropolitan areas were uh, built out prior to uh, the ban of CSO infrastructure, uh, and they're either trying to develop completely separate stormwater and wastewater uh, municipal utility lines, or they're providing uh, offline or inline combined sewer detention. Uh, this would be an example of an offline combined sewer storage system that would accept stormwater flows um, and, and mitigate the high flow event to the wastewater facility to prevent the overflow event. Uh, and the one interesting thing, in addition to the quality of the fabrication here, is to, to notice that the invert of the system is channelized to allow low flow to flow through the system. They can operate the system, uh, have a nice non-slip surface to walk on inside the structure, uh, and then obviously during high flow events that would be inundated but no one would be accessing the system. Uh, we do a lot of pump stations. Uh, we're able to fabricate pump stations in up to 11 foot diameter and about 50 feet in depth, uh, completely prefabricated, delivered to the project. So what that means is all inlet outlet piping, uh, energy dissipation, hopper bottoms, uh, base elbow or breakaway elbows, all prefabricated into the system with guide rails. Um, all that needs to happen when the, the structure is delivered to the project site is it needs to be set. Uh, the pumps are set on guide rails that are in the structure already. Uh, the external plumbing is attached and, and the wiring is, is installed as well. Uh, and then they can backfill the structure. So for an 11 foot by 50 foot pump station, uh, theoretically could be installed in two to three days versus uh, multiple weeks to install an equivalent concrete structure in the field. And more importantly, the structure's vessel is immune to hydrogen sulfide deterioration uh, and will last 100 years uh, for that particular project. So we are able to reduce not only the material cost, but the installation time and cost as well, and provide a longer lasting sustainable solution for that project's owner. Uh, one thing to note is we do quite a few manhole structures. Uh, however, it's, it's not known to most engineers that we can take a different approach with polyethylene systems that are, it's not available to concrete structures. Uh, most concrete structures rely on a conventional base and riser geometry approach where they'll either build a giant rectangular box structure and have a riser off that, or they'll have a, a circular structure with a riser off that. Um, the, the flexibility and versatility of polyethylene allow us to create a number of different geometries that would not be conceivable or uh, buildable in the concrete world. Uh, in this particular case, we have two large diameter uh, pipe structures that uh, require a manhole riser. If this were a concrete structure, it would have been a 15 foot wide by 8 foot by maybe 20 foot tall rectangular concrete box. Uh, so in addition to having a completely watertight system that's got a 100-year design life, they're actually able to take advantage of the versatility and fabrication capabilities of polyethylene to provide a more efficient structure in general, as you can see there. And the last one before we discuss thermoplastic fusion welding uh, is, a, is a very interesting project that actually combines uh, the, the versatility of the wheelite vessel and the wheelite panel section to provide an above ground uh, structure for UV disinfection for a potable water facility. Um, most uh, horizontal applications will require some level of haunch support. Uh, in buried applications, that not, that's not necessary because we have the soil backfill and the pipe is a soil structure interaction system. However, when we bring that pipe above ground and we do not have that soil to su support the haunches, we have to fabricate some haunch support. And in this particular application for this UV project, we're able to fabricate wheel panel, haunch support, uh, and feet that also served as a supporting structure for the system and deliver a complete 100% uh, high-density polyethylene wheelite UV treatment system to this potable water facility. Just shows you the versatility uh, and also ingenuity that we can help you on projects. Uh, you may have a challenge or an application you're not quite sure how to solve. Uh, frequently, folks will bring those challenges to us and we'll collaborate with them to come up with a number of solutions until we pin down the right one for their project. And we're here to help you in that regard. Uh, please reach out to us if you have any challenges like that. So before we uh, uh, move on to um, 
some of the, the design standards, it's important for us to discuss the, the fundamentals of thermoplastic fusion and welding because um, anyone can, can go out and buy a, a fusion welding gun. Uh, but it's important for us to understand the training uh, standards and specifications and quality control associated with thermoplastic fusion welding to uh, make sure that our clients receive a high quality product that does last both structurally from a structural perspective and durability perspective for the 100 year design life. So for those not familiar, thermoplastic welding uh, is typically referred refers to a number of plastic welding applications. We have polyethylene, polypropylene, as some might know, but you can also weld polyvinyl chloride, uh, CPVC, PVDF, and a number of other plastics uh, can be welded using thermoplastic welding. But where we're concerned, we're primarily concerned with polyethylene welding and specifically fusion and extrusion welding. Uh, fusion and extrusion welding are two terms that are often interchanged and we'll differentiate between the two in a second, but they both essentially rely on an application of heat uh, to bring the base materials A and B as you see in that sketch there on the bottom and the filler material to a predetermined specified temperature uh, depending on material thickness and type. Uh, generally about 480 degrees to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit uh, to create a homogeneous molten pool of material or a weld pool as they refer to it. Uh, and then when that material all arrives at the predetermined temperature, uh, we're, we're able to achieve molecular alignment of that material and actually have a weld seam that's stronger than the original material. We'll show you that in a little bit when we talk about a tensile strength test. Uh, so that's really the objective of fusion and extrusion welding, is to bring materials A and B, the two to be bonded, and the filler to the predetermined temperature to create a molten, molten pool of material and a homoge homogeneous mass of material. Uh, and we should not confuse thermoplastic fusion and extrusion welding with techniques such as gluing, brazing, soldering, uh, which do not melt the base material, uh, will actually result in a seam. Uh, there where the thermoplastic weld uh, occurs. And we'll talk about it a little bit. Uh, the quality of the weld is, is highly dependent upon the training, knowledge, and skill of the operator, and, and, we'll, and we'll also reinforce the need for a quality control program. So uh, often um, interchanged as far as the vernacular, fusion and extrusion welding are terms that you've probably heard. Uh, fusion welding typically refers to hand fusion welding, which requires multiple passes of a single rod um, and then extrusion welding is a single pass of a molten extruded material, as you can see there on the left-hand side in that isometric. Um, we'll show you a snapshot of fusion welding here. You can see uh, the, the welding bead or welding rod is, is being applied through the head of the system, which has a shoe at the head of it, uh, and applies that welding material. Also through the handle of the welding tool, hot air is fed through, uh, you can see that flow of current to fed through the tool to not only heat the welding rod, but also heat the two materials, base A and base B materials, to the prescribed temperature. Um, Conversely, extrusion welding can use either a granulate funnel where we'll actually feed pellets of polyethylene material or a wire reel uh, and they'll be fed through an extrusion chamber which will heat that material into a molten mass of material that will then be applied to the weld uh, with a welding shoe that's designed for the specific geometry of the weld. So if we have a perpendicular weld or a chamfer or a butt end connection, we'll have a specific weld geometry that's based on standards and practices uh, that needs to be utilized for that particular weld. Uh, and similar to fusion welding, we also have uh, air, or they sometimes refer to as hot gas, but air is heated in a heating chamber that also heats the base A and base B materials prior to application of the weld to ensure we arrive at the prescribed temperature. So we're heating the two materials, we're heating the extrusion weld, and we're bringing those all up to the required temperature uh, and to get a nice uh, molten weld pool and a homogeneous bond between the materials. Uh, fusion welding is typically reserved for, hand fusion welding is for small applications where we can't get the larger extrusion welding guns, as you can see here, uh, into that particular part. All, or we'll reserve fusion, hand fusion welding for um, to set up a part or a piece while we're getting it ready for extrusion welding. Uh, but as you can see there, extrusion welding guns are not small. Uh, part of the quality control and quality assurance program for any facility that does extrusion welding needs to consider operator fatigue and position. Uh, 
Uh, if we have overhead welds, uh, we need to be concerned with how long is that particular technician working at overhead weld, uh, and we need to make sure that fatigue does not become an issue with the quality of the particular weld. Uh, to that effect, uh, thermoplastic welding is extremely operator dependent and it's important for any company that manufactures systems using thermoplastic welding to have strict quality control standards and procedures in place. Uh, it's, it's entirely uh, dependent upon the training, certification, and quality control program to ensure our clients get high quality systems. Um, with the temperature or melt of the nozzle, the rate at which the weld is being applied, uh, the, way, the rate at which the material exits the nozzle, uh, the amount of force applied to the filler rod, the composition of the filler, diameter, diameter of the geometry of the rod or pellets, and the design or size of the welding nozzle all come into play, as well as the preparation of the material to be welded. Uh, for this reason, some extensive standards have been established in North America and worldwide regarding thermoplastic welding. Uh, in North America, we have the American Welding Society, specifically AWS B2.4 2012, Standard Welding Procedure uh, for Specification of Welding of Thermoplastics. Uh, this is really a self-regulated process whereby the manufacturer will develop a quality control program that meets AWS B2.4 2012 uh, and submit uh, test samples for different welders within their program uh, to ensure that their, their system and their process and their quality control program meets uh, AWS B2.4. Uh, DVS is the German Welding Society. Uh, they've been around for a little bit longer than the American Welding Society and are a recognized standard worldwide uh, for standards and specifications and certification of thermoplastic welders. Um, they have a, a number of different welding programs. They'll, they're able to certify and train uh, thermoplastic welding trainers, and then under that training practice, those trainers can then certify uh, thermoplastic welders for a number of different positions, applications, and materials. And as you might expect, uh, there are ASTM standards that are appropriate for thermoplastic welded structures or polyethylene structural systems. Uh, some of the ones that are most important uh, that we run into frequently uh, are ASTM F1759, which applies to high-density polyethylene manholes. This would apply to all of our pump stations, manhole structures, any riser system off a horizontal vessel. Uh, 1759 would be applicable there. Um, another one that's important for any manufacturer to adhere to is C1147, which is the standard practice for determining weld strength of thermoplastics. Uh, this is where we determine how strong is that weld, what does the geometry of that weld need to be, uh, what is the chamfer geometry, how much material needs to be applied, uh, and, and, and the like. So uh, C1147 really is the, the hinge point of structural evaluation of the thermoplastic weld that needs to be adhered to by any manufacturer. Uh, there are a number of other standards here. Uh, one that we'll discuss in a little bit is D2321, which relates to underground installation, uh, backfill standards and placement and compaction standards. And then we have ASTM F894, which is applicable to Wheelite structural profile wall pipe, which we'll discuss here in a second. Um, so we have AWS, DVS, and ASTM standards that, that you know, religiously define uh, different standards, quality control programs, and, and means and methods by which high quality thermoplastic welding, welded systems can be delivered to a project. Uh, and if you work with us on any given application, we'll develop a, a, a white paper or a boilerplate standard specification for you to edit and incorporate into your project uh, to ensure that the manufacturer of the system that you specify meets these standards and you get a high quality project product delivered to your project. Um, so once we have a high quality standard in place, we have high quality uh, quality control program in place and all of our welding technicians are trained, uh, we also need to have a quality assurance program in place to ensure that the actual project and the application are, are meeting those standards. Uh, the first line of defense and quality assurance for any given weld is a visual inspection. Uh, we're generally looking for what we refer to as a, a haze or heat affected zone, a properly welded polyethylene system will have a dull appearing haze following the weld. Um, this is where you'll have a consistent dull appearance following the weld seam. If the weld is overheated or underheated, the poly 
polyethylene will, will have splashes of material and look very shiny or not have a consistent haze or, or dull appearing effect around the weld seam. So uh, the first line of defense is, is very similar to steel welding where a visual inspection is important uh, and we want to look for a dull appearing consistent haze throughout the material. Another method uh, that we utilize quite frequently on our systems is we pressure test the internal voids. Uh, this is something that is unique to Wheelite. Uh, we're able to pressurize the internal voids around any particular penetration. And because the annular space inside the profile is continuous throughout the structure, a pressure test of the void on either side of the discontinuity will ensure that we have a 100% watertight system. We typically pressurize the void to about 5% uh, and then we'll also spray a soapy solution on the joint uh, in the vicinity of the welds uh, to ensure that we, we don't have any pressure leakage. So pressure test of internal voids and visual inspection are critical to uh, pre-shipment quality assurance. Uh, there's a couple other means out there. There's high voltage spark tests that can be used for materials up to about one inch in thickness. Since we are much thicker than one inches, uh, that's not applicable most of the time for us. Uh, ultrasonic testing, I put that in here just to make you all aware of it. Uh, there are some consistency issues with ultrasonic testing of thermoplastic welds that they're developing. Uh, however, it is an emerging technology. We should see that be uh, fine-tuned in the next five to ten years. Uh, and there's a scholarly article there on ultrasonic weld tests if you're interested. Um, and then lastly, as one might expect, in-field leak tests are common, uh, especially in wastewater or industrial applications. Um, you know, we'll have a 24-hour drawdown test, uh, which would need to adhere to ASTM D2487, which is the standard practice for infiltration and exfil exfiltration acceptance testing. So uh, those are your primary quality assurance programs that would typically be found uh, on any thermoplastic project. And here you can see a snapshot, as we talked about earlier, of a pressure test. Again, unique to Wheelite because the annular space is a helically wound annular space continuous throughout the structure, uh, we can pressure test uh, for any uh, slab, either base slab or top slab, any penetration through the vessel itself. Uh, we can pressurize that annular space to about 5 psi. If it holds pressure, we know we have a high quality weld and a completely watertight system prior to shipment. Uh, it's unique for us because it's nice to know before the system arrives to the job site if we do have a 24-hour drawdown uh, requirement on that project that we know for 100% certainty that we're not going to have uh, any leakage in the field and ha have to uh, play where's Waldo or hunt for a leak on a system after it's been backfilled. So um, I'd like to transition now onto more of the design side, pipe and vessel design specifically. Um, when we're talking about pipe and vessel design, uh, we're generally talking about horizontal applications where we're running either from manhole to manhole or we have a uh, pipe in a horizontal configuration. Uh, again, we manufacture two types of high-density polyethylene materials. We have our solid wall sclera pipe, which adheres to ASTM D2412 on the left-hand side, and we have our Wheelite structural profile wall, which follows ASTM F894. Now, for solid wall pipe, we use the term pipe stiffness, or PS, as a measurement uh, for stiffness. Uh, for structural profile wall, we use ring stiffness constant, or RSC, as a, as a stiffness measurement. Um, it's not really that complicated. They're often interchanged and they're often confused, uh, but it should be known that they are different. Uh, pipe stiffness is based on a force load measured at a prescribed deflection position of a plate moving at a prescribed speed on a sample of prescribed length. So it's a pipe stiffness is a measurement, um, whereas ring stiffness is a constant. Uh, it's weighted for size, where ring stiffness is a load in pounds divided by deflection as a percent and divided by the sample length in feet. Uh, slight nuance between the two and how the two are defined, but we should not get in the weeds on that. Just know what they are and know that for solid wall, we have pipe stiffness. And for structural profile wall, we have what's referred to as a ring stiffness constant as defined by uh, their different ASTM numbers. Um, as one might expect, both pipe stiffness and the ring stiffness constant, or PS and RSC, are interrelated, and they have the same fundamental basic equation where they're defined as a load over a travel distance and sample length is the basic equation. And in accordance with PPI Chapter 6, the Plastic Pipe Institute Chapter 6 for Design of Thermoplastic Materials and Polyethylene Pipe, uh, the two can be related via equation X1.2, as you see there.
Uh, so for deflection measurements uh, or deflection calculations in accordance with Plastic Pipe Institute, uh, we, we utilize Spangler's modified Iowa formula for, for solid wall polyethylene pipe. We use equation 3-10 as you can see there. And for uh, structural profile wall pipe, we use equation 3-11. Um, now again, as we said in the beginning of this presentation, we're, we're not going to be able to cover a lot of this in, in tremendous depth and detail. Uh, however, I would encourage you all to uh, visit Chapter 6 of the Plastic Pipe Institute. Uh, it's a nice detailed design methodology and some specifications and standards and calculations related to both solid wall and structural profile wall pipe in accordance with ASTM. I mean, sorry, uh, Plastic Pipe Institute Chapter 6. Uh, in lieu of us all becoming experts, uh, using, uh, you know, hand calculations to, to determine plastic pipe deflection, buckling, and thrust, uh, we also have developed a very uh, useful tool online at our website. Uh, it's a pipe design calculator. You can see the URL there at the top. Uh, it is free to use for all engineers who would be interested in uh, determining a number of different uh, design characteristics for any pipe horizontal vessel application. Uh, we have pressure flow, gravity flow, uh, flotation calculations, wall buckling, uh, we can do marine calculations, and a number of other applications. Uh, but probably most applicable to uh, horizontal vessel structures uh, we, would be the buried pipe design tool that you can see there. And that tool can be utilized for both uh, wheel light structural profile wall and sclera pipe solid wall. Uh, but for engineered systems, um, we're typically looking at wheel light. So we'll look at the wheel light profile wall pipe uh, Berry Design Calculator. Uh, and here you can see a snapshot on the left-hand side of the inputs for that particular uh, interface where we have a number of different variables uh, and the calculations associated with that. And on the right-hand side, you can see the output, uh, the calculation output. This is not a black box. This has been vetted by third-party engineering firms and PPI. Uh, we're, hit, we're happy to share the calculation method with anyone who asks. Um, and it also is a good point for me to bring up is frequently engineers uh, will come to us and ask for cover height tables. At Upanor, we've resisted uh, distributing cover height tables to the industry, primarily because pipe is an engineered material and, and it has a number of different parameters associated with effective design. And to develop a cover height table, we have to make assumptions regarding some of those input parameters. If we make conservative assumptions and the engineer uh, has a project that does not meet those assumptions, he may be under-designing for that particular project. Uh, or, or alternatively, he may have a project that has better uh, um, actual infield conditions than the assumptions that were made in the cover height table, and he may be over-designing for that particular application. Uh, so we've maintained the opinion and position that a pipe is an engineered system, uh, and that all the different parameters for that particular pipe design in accordance with PPI Chapter 6 need to be accounted for. Uh, and we've resisted distributing cover height tables for that reason, and alternatively have created this powerful and very easy to use online design calculator that either myself or Adam are happy to help you with or feel free to utilize it yourself uh, and then bounce the results off us if you have any issues or questions or comments. Uh, so what I've done here is kind of demonstrate uh, some of those uh, input parameters and some of the things that would be factored into uh, consideration uh, for any pipe design. Obviously we have height of cover, that's the first thing most engineers consider is height of cover over crown of pipe. Um, and then another one would be depth of water table below grade. Um, and those two factored in, obviously. Uh, we also have the, the gamma or specific weight of soil. Um, here you have a number of different types of materials that can be pulled up. And if you hit the, the uh, magnifying glass to the right there, uh, you can see we have a number of different specific weights of soils, particularly silts and clays, glacial till, crushed rock. All these materials have a, have a range of specific weights. Um, and if you don't know for a given project, it's important to say, OK, I don't have geotechnical boring for this particular project. I'm not sure what this is. You would typically assume 120 uh, PCF for dry and maybe 130 to 150 uh, PCF for wet. And then know that you are including that uh, standard or requirement in the specification, that that's a specific weight of soil that you've accounted for uh, in the event that they encounter other that needs to be addressed and the geotechnical engineer needs to be aware of it. Uh, additionally, we have embedment modules of the existing material. In accordance with ASTM D2321, um, we have the um, 
standard proctor typically needs to be about a 90% standard proctor and that's going to give us for most materials around a 2000 modulus as you can see here. If we know we have better compaction we can use a higher modulus. If we know we have lower compaction or even dumped material which is usually a big no-no um, we can use a lower modulus for that particular input. Uh, again, 90% proctor is your standard uh, compaction uh, per ASTM D2321. Here again, we're going to take into account the modulus of the native soil. So if we know what we have um, for the native soil, then we can account for it. If we don't, we can make some assumptions and be sure that that is in the specification, that the existing soil module has been assumed for 2,000 uh, and in, in uh, Geotechnical engineer of record should confirm that, and we'll talk about that in the standards under ASTM D2321 in a little bit. Uh, compensating multiplier for temperature frequently doesn't come up in buried pipe design. However, if we have an above ground application, we're going to want to account for temperature variation. Uh, soil internal angle of friction, as you can see here, um, that needs to be accounted for as well, the Poisson's ratio. Um, we have RSC. Uh, RSC refers to the thickness or amount of material. We have different RSC values for different materials. Um, I usually uh, associate those rather incorrectly with the term gauge, but we have a thickness of material, RSC 160. It goes up from there to an RSC 250, which is heavier than uh, the RSC 160, and then it even gets heavier than that RSC 400. So those are strength indicators or thickness indicators in the ring stiffness constant. 160 is uh, then we increase to 250 and then to 400 just to kind of explain what that means. Um, service life duration. Uh, this is an important point to note because this relates to the structure's ability to be designed to 100 years structurally. So if we frequently think or limit our thinking to 100 year service life in the face of deterioration of the material. In other words, uh, pH corrosion, hydrogen sulfide deterioration. Polyethylene is known to have a 100 year service life on the durability side. Uh, but we also have to consider designing from a structural perspective to the 100 year design life and that needs to account for the load duration and the design life. So if we want a load duration of 100 years or say a highway application, uh, we're going to input a 27,000 modulus as you see there. Uh, if it's a shorter duration application, a temporary project or the, the design requirements less than 100 years, if it's 50 years you can use a higher modulus as you see. Um, vacuum load does not come up very often in um, gravity applications and even in some low pressure applications, but this is available if you're doing like long distance wastewater transmission main or you have a project where you do in fact know you have a vacuum load duration. Uh, wheel load uh, for Canada is CL625 frequently. Uh, if you're in the United States, we're looking at HS25 or HS20 uh, per LRFD HL93 calculations. We can accommodate uh, wheel load calculations and, and provide those to you. Uh, bedding angle, obviously direct bury is um, you know, most applications, but we also do a number of reline applications. We can account for reline here. Uh, and then short duration or long duration if you're in a parking lot environment or a warehouse loading distribution center versus a highway. Uh, and then again, sustained vacuum pressure doesn't come up very often, but it is here if you need to utilize it. Uh, so that's the design tool. I encourage everyone to get online and check it out uh, and feel free to utilize it. If you have a project, we're also here and available to run this for you and provide you with a number of different uh, results for different applications. Uh, but um, regardless, we have ASTM uh, F894 um, design methodology in accordance with Plastic Pipe Institute Chapter 6 uh, that's all based on material testing. So the design methodology and the results we get in our calculator and the calculations for deflection and buckling all come from material testing. As we said earlier, Upinor is one of the few manufacturers in North America that has full-scale deflection testing at its Huntsville facility where we can test all the diameters of both solid wall and structural profile wall pipe and then we use that deflection testing as the basis of our design method and that testing is certified under NSF. Uh, so that's an important point uh, and, and again not many manufacturers have that full-scale deflection testing capability. Uh, we also do destructive testing 
um, where we'll actually take a coupon sample and recall back to the thermoplastic welding session where we, we talked about the weld being the strongest part of the system. Uh, to validate that and also validate the strength of the entire cross-section, we'll take a coupon sample of the profile that you see there represented by the red box above. Uh, we'll take two joints from the system that have two welds. And when you refer to that middle photo, you can see a weld seam at the top and a weld seam at the bottom. Those would be our outside fusion welds, uh, and then the profile section between. And as we talked about earlier, the weld needs to be the strongest part of the material, so we would expect this particular material to fail before the welds. And at about 2,900 PSI, we can see that is indeed the case when we tested failure. Uh, the welds remained intact, uh, no deflection there, and as you would expect, they're thicker. Uh, and if we had a nice homogeneous weld seam there, we would expect this result. That's exactly what we want to see in a tensile strength test. Um, here we can provide coupon samples of that material on any given project to the client, owner, engineer of record to validate that the material they're receiving on that particular project has passed the test uh, and that a high quality system is being delivered to that particular project. Very common for us to provide this on any application. We also do compressive strength tests from time to time. Um, and it doesn't come up very often, but from time to time we do have to provide it and have the capability to provide compressive strength data for any application we're working on. So we talked about pipe design uh, when we have horizontal applications. Uh, however, when we start to cut into those vessels, uh, either put a riser structure or a bulkhead or other applications, uh, we have to develop another means to uh, cr calculate the structural integrity of the system, the deflection, shear, and moment of the particular structure. So, uh, you know, manhole riser applications, internal baffle walls that may have uh, uh, hydrostatic pressure differential across them. Uh, we have bulkheads that may have significant amount of material being removed from them to accommodate penetrations, uh, rectangular structures, and then obviously deep or shallow burial structures. We need a way to determine the structural rigidity and deflection of the system that's not in line with PPI because PPI is limited to vessel design. And the two methods we utilize at Upinor are a Candy 2D planar uh, tool, which is a, a finite element analysis program that is a two-dimensional slice through the system. And Candy stands for Culvert Analysis and Design. Uh, it's been around since 1970. It was developed by uh, Dr. Katona. We also have an ANSYS three-dimensional finite element analysis program, which models the system in 3D. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with FEA analysis, it's essentially we break the structure up into many, many thousands of nodes. As you can see here, this particular project was this one single wall was broken up into 26,000 nodes, uh, or equivalent 13,000 elements. Uh, hence the finite element uh, concept or, or, or nomenclature. Uh, we, we input into the program the uh, modulus of elasticity, the moment of inertia, the tensile strength of the material, and then we apply actual loads to the structure to determine the displacement of the system. Uh, and then based on that calculation, uh, we have maximum allowable displacements. Uh, we'll either reinforce the vessel. Uh, the wheel eye profile is unique in that it has that large internal annular space that allows us to reinforce it for different applications to accommodate virtually any loading and minimize the amount of the deflection we get on a project. Uh, we'll use ANSYS FEA for that. Alternatively, uh, candy FEA analysis are very useful to model um, unusual soil conditions or vehicular loading in combination with soil conditions because candy, uh, its strength is in the soil structure interaction system where we're actually able to model the existing subgrade, uh, the non-critical backfill zone uh, B and the yellow critical backfill zone A, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, model the cover over the structure and the wheel or vehicular load that's applied at, at different points uh, along the system to determine the deflection and displacement of the system using candy. So a very powerful tool for that from that application perspective. So when we uh, exceed the limits of pipe and vessel design, we'll use a candy FEA analysis or an ANSYS analysis and we'll provide that on any given project when applicable. So uh, we talked about pipe vessel design, talked about candy FEA analysis. Uh, now I'd like to transfer into buoyancy countermeasures, which is a common question engineers will ask, is since your material is one-tenth the weight of concrete, uh, is buoyancy or anti-buoyancy countermeasure a, a major challenge for you? Uh, and the answer to that is not really. Uh, for vertical applications, we can increase the width of the base plate outside the system to capture sufficient soil uh, to anchor the system. And then we take the similar approach to horizontal vessels. Uh, 
Um, as most know, buoyancy calculations are based on Archimedes' principle, where the net vertical force upwards is based on the volume of displaced water, or the volume of the structure, times the specific weight of water, or 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. Um, and the force downwards is, if you can look at that free body diagram there in the middle of the page, uh, is based on the weight of the structure, and in vertical applications, the force of the soil column on the base plate. So we, we're not going to arbitrarily increase the weight of the structure. Uh, however, we will increase the width of that base plate to capture more soil outside the structure. And for most projects, we do not need a concrete collar around the base. We can increase that width of that base plate to about 12 inches. Uh, when that doesn't work, we can also do a cast-in-place collar around the base to increase the width of the base plate. As you can see there, it's a simple collar about 12 inches thick, uh, utilizing number four bar at six inches on center. Uh, no more than two to three cubic yards of concrete to increase the width of the base plate. It doesn't come up very often, but we do have the ability to design that when it does. Uh, we also have a handy buoyancy calculation design tool that we're happy to share with you on any given project, or we can uh, run that calculation for you depending on the situation. Uh, for, for horizontal vessels, it's not much different. Um, we, we essentially uh, distribute that um, vertical load through straps over the structure to anchors that also catch the vertical soil column above and provide some weight as well. Um, so you can see there we have those those anchors that actually create a horizontal plane underneath that soil column and then the strapping system to hold the system down. Uh, both horizontal and vertical vessels are designed to accommodate a fully submerged condition. Uh, that's essentially because we're usually not aware of what the actual water table is and from a, a, a factor of safety or, or conservative design approach, it's best to just assume a fully submerged condition and uh, no matter what happens in the field, we're, we're able to accommodate it. Um, just briefly, we also have a completely prefabricated buoyancy countermeasure. Depending on the project, we can ship it out to the project site. Uh, complete designed and fabricated all the contractors to do is to remove the system, uh, place it adjacent to our structure, have the strapping system installed, and he's ready to go and has his buoyancy countermeasure. So it eliminates any potential cast in place work in the field or the need to ship uh, large uh, flat precast anchors. Um, and then before we get into project profiles, I have a, a minute or two here to discuss uh, backfill standards. ASTM D2 through 2321 uh, is the primary standard that relates to underground installation of thermoplastic pipes. Uh, essentially, any flexible buried structure is going to adhere to ASTM D2321. Uh, it's been well vetted and proven to be a valuable uh, standard and specification for the bury of any underground structure, uh, and it is the standard that we adhere to for the bury very, uh, and installation of all of our systems. Uh, without getting into the, the specific details, the general understanding of D2321, you need to understand that it defines a uh, subgrade parameter. If you can recall back to the candy finite element uh, sketch that I showed you earlier, that's very similar to this, uh, where it will define uh, the modulus of the subgrade in existing soil. That would be the area to the white area. Uh, we have uh, cross section B or the area B, which is your less than critical backfill zone, or referred to as non-select backfill material that is compacted to 90 percent. Uh, however, the requirements for section B are less than string, less stringent than section A, which is what we refer to as our critical backfill zone A. Um, so we have critical backfill zone A, less than critical backfill zone B, and existing subgrade. Uh, we have a depth, a minimum depth of material below the invert, and a minimum cover height over the structure. <clears throat> ASTM D2321 calls out for D over 2 as the minimum separation. However, we can reduce that by running a candy analysis if required. So if you have a project where footprint is an issue uh, and we need to uh, decrease the spacing either between pipes or decrease the critical backfill zone, uh, we can take a look at that by running a candy analysis. Uh, alternatively, D3, D2321 still applies to rectangular structures, as you can see here. We have critical backfill zone A, uh, backfill zone B, and the existing soil uh, section. Uh, and the way this relates to the specification and the material is primarily what engineers and contractors are most focused on to ensure that we have the right material in those backfill zones. So in backfill zone A, which is our critical backfill zone, we have either a class 1, class 2 material, or some might be familiar with the ASHTO A1, A3 type of material. Uh, this is a crushed angular rock. Uh, typically compacted to 90 to 95%, uh, 90 being the minimum, um, and a free draining material. 
Uh, this is why you often see contractors utilizing what most folks might refer to as a 57 stone or a 21 or 27A material uh, for backfill uh, in the zone A uh, zone. Uh, and then we have the zone B, which is a little bit more open to uh, having fines. We can even have CL and ML materials in there. As long as we have greater than or equal to 30% retained on the 200 sieve, uh, we can have some other materials in there. But again, that does need to be compacted to 90% uh, at a minimum in accordance with the specification. So we have a zone A critical backfill zone and zone B. Uh, these are the classifications, types of material that are appropriate for those particular applications. Uh, and we need to have them compacted to 90%. Uh, more information here, obviously, uh, for the different classifications of soil. Uh, we can get into that uh, in detail uh, offline. Um, but some key points for backfill before we get into project profiles here is um, these are the key considerations that need to be incorporated into the specifications uh, for any given project. Um, one is we need to have a geotechnical engineer or quality control supervisor over the project to ensure what happens in the field meets specifications. Uh, more often uh, than, than we would like to say happen uh, is a contractor will deviate from either the material specification or the placement and compaction specification. Uh, as you can see in the photos on the bottom, we have uh, the one on the left there, uh, the two barrel system is looking great. It has a well compacted subgrade. Uh, we have the trench excavation uh, perfectly laid back at a one to one, plenty of room to compact uniformly on both sides and bring that material up and even lift. So they're ready to go and, and backfill. On um, the structure in the middle, we can see them using walk behind equipment uh, to bring the backfill up in even uniform lifts and compact uniformly across the structure. They're meeting D2321. Unfortunately, photo on the right, uh, they don't have sufficient room outside the, uh, the haunches of the structure to compact that material, uh, nor are they bringing it and placing it in even lifts. Uh, so they're not going to be able to compact that material, uh, and they're not going to be able to bring it up in even lifts to, um, to really meet D2321. Uh, and, and again, it's important to note that these are soil structure interaction systems, so we do need to have high quality backfill placed in accordance with the standard and specification in the field. And the way to best achieve that on any given project is to have geotechnical engineer of record or a quality control inspector uh, on site to uh, confirm that that's being done in the field, to confirm that the subgrade meets uh, the specifications to confirm that the material delivered um, meets what, what was reported or uh, meets D2321, uh, to confirm that the material is placed and compacted uh, in uniform lifts in accordance with 2321, uh, and, and those are important criteria for any buried structure. Uh, also, it's important to note here that a clean graded aggregate uh, can be used on a project. However, uh, if clean graded aggregate meaning, for those that don't know, uh, we have no fines or mediums in the material. It's generally washed material with a minimal amount of fines, uh, typically encountered in 57 stone or other angular rock materials. Um, if we, we want to use that material, it's typically okay, but we want to provide a geotextile separation layer between the surrounding subgrade and that material. Uh, because the subgrade fines will try to migrate into the void spaces of that material, and uh, you could potentially get consolidation of the subgrade. So uh, whenever a clean graded material is utilized, we want to make sure they use a, a geotextile separation layer as well. It's an inexpensive uh, belt and suspender to ensure we don't get fine migration and consolidation. Uh, so with the remaining two minutes I have, I'm going to attempt to uh, just show you some snapshots of projects to give you an example of uh, types of projects we can support you on. Uh, one project near and dear to my heart that we're actually uh, heading out to do the startup on the control and skid system next week is the LA County Federal Courthouse. It's a 106,000 gallon continuous 150 linear foot 11 foot diameter cistern. Interesting thing about this project is we had to design it to uh, sit outside the zone of influence of the existing building structural footing and the roadway, very small strip of land available, as you can see there where that tr uh, track is uh, for that excavator, that's where the existing roadway was. Uh, so we're able to uh, shoehorn our system into that, that very small footprint to provide uh, quite a bit of storage. Additionally, we were also able to provide a, a vertical pump station. The reason we took the pump station offline is we're able to uh, isolate the submergence depth required for those pumps uh, and make the, the storage vessel a little bit more efficient. Uh, we also provided some internal baffle wall controls, energy dissipation, and water quality features built into the system uh, to further enhance the functionality and water quality of the recycled rainwater for this particular project. 
Uh, this project demonstrates just some of the versatility of our fabrication capabilities. This combines sclera pipe and wheelite uh, for wastewater treatment CSO plant upgrade biofilter manifold. I'll just show you some of the level of detail and complexity that we can fabricate systems to. Uh, we showed you this photo earlier in the backfill process. This is a relatively small diameter 60-inch wheelite CSO combined sewer overflow system with field welded joints um, for the city of Saskatoon. Um, here we have a Hall Crescent Sanitary CSO system here. Uh, large-scale sewage detention tanks. It's a three-barrel manifold, 120-inch wheel light system that also used uh, field extrusion welded joints, as you can see the technician there on the photo on the right, uh, welding inside diameter joints uh, to a 7 PSI watertight criteria. Denver International Airport was a replacement project where we replaced 16 of their concrete manholes uh, due to the glycol and hydrogen sulfide deterioration of their structures. We were able to prefabricate some um, wheelite manholes, as you can see here, with riser structures uh, in an airport aircraft loaded environment, which is a heavily loaded environment. We had to do some custom design, and the, all of these structures accepted a, a concrete load relief slab over top of the structure to accommodate uh, the heavy airport traffic. Um, we showed you this project earlier, just demonstrating the versatility of our material uh, and what we refer to as engineered art. Um, another project here in British Columbia it really demonstrates what I referred to earlier about the versatility of polyethylene and, and wheelite structural profile systems to uh, provide a much more efficient geometry than concrete can normally provide for manhole applications. You can see there we have a large diameter confluence uh, that would normally require a fairly large structure for a manhole. Uh, we're able to do much more efficiently and cost effectively using polyethylene. As you can see there, we're able to custom fabricate four manhole structures on this project in the city of Burnaby. Uh, this is an interesting uh, project. This is a 1800 millimeter main uh, with a 1200 millimeter uh, Y and lateral system. As you can see there, it's completely prefabricated with reducers and Y section uh, to uh, speed up uh, the project installation. Uh, they had a 24 hour installation for this sec section, uh, overnight installation, and we were able to accommodate on that, that on this project. Uh, and then lastly, we have the uh, storm relief project in Fort St. John. Uh, this was large diameter RSC 250, 2100 millimeter with five mitered elbows and manholes. Uh, normally those would be concrete riser structures. Um, and we we're also able to accommodate a, a bulkhead and reducer, as you can see there. So we're able to basically upsize the storm drain pipe uh, to provide storage in line with its original alignment uh, to provide overflow storage. We're also able to provide dissimilar material connections for both the concrete, which you can see there on the right, and the top middle, you can see the PVC uh, inflow uh, pipes. We're able to provide dissimilar material connections for those particular uh, laterals as well. Just some examples. So with that, I ended on time, and I'd like to thank everybody uh, for, for attending. If you have any questions, you can submit them through the GoTo application to Adam Repetikowski at Upanor.com. Uh, please follow us on LinkedIn uh, and visit our webpage to sign up for the web calculator, and stay tuned. We will have another um, a webinar series uh, announced on September 15th regarding Culvert Reline. So we hope to talk to you then. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Take care.